and we are armed. We say all praises be to the Creator, all power to His people. In the name of Yahshua, the Black Revolutionary Messiah, I greet you, my brothers and sisters, in the spirit of truth and the words of peace. Shalom alaikum. Give a special salute to the Black Messiahs. I'm out to wear. Stop waiting for a savior and be one. Stop waiting for a savior and be one. Tonight, family, we have another special book review. It's featuring our beloved Minister of Information, Sister Spitfire. Tonight, we're going to talk about the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And the reason why we are dealing with this is because in Durham, and, and I'm sure in your city too, we're dealing with gun violence. And one of the major holdbacks dealing with gun violence is we get caught between what to do with those who, who commit it and what to do with law enforcement. On one hand, we don't want people running free, just killing innocent people. We don't want that. On the other hand, we got to understand the uh, history of the prison industrial complex and how people actually make a profit off of really young black men going to prison. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into this excellent book review with Sister Spitfire. So it's your show, Sister. All right. Hey, people. So this is my book. This is what the cover looks like. Um, this book, I actually had to read it uh, twice. Uh, once just to kind of read it. The second time I had to go through again and kind of like really... Um, look at it and go back in time um just because there's so much information uh, there this book is like packed with information um packed with dates and times policies and it can be a lot for um someone that's not a strong reader or someone that just wants to be um lightly entertained it is not for the the lighthearted um it, it actually had me kind of sad about it when i was reading it just because so much of the things that were in the past that were categorized as jim crow were so prevalent and so thriving today mm -hmm. uh, so that we don't even realize the parallels within so the author um really that's what she does throughout this book she kind of speaks about the parallels um you know if we would think about this multiverse thing can you just imagine if you were a slave here and you went to another universe and you were slave but they just changed the color of the clothing that you wore and called it something else wow. um, so basically she she pretty much breaks down this whole system of uh, bamboozlement that we're living in today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's called the New Jim Crow Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Um, and just uh, off the start, I always like to start with the introduction. Um, she starts off with the classic reason for generational curses among black men. Uh, one of the big reasons is prison and the short and long-term political and economical effect. So short term, you know, you're in prison, you may, you know, you may get arrested and you may just get locked up and miss work for a couple of days. And because of that, you may lose your job. But let's say you're in there for a little while longer, you're going to lose more. So the higher the conviction, um, it doesn't matter. Once you're in the pr prison system, you are marked. Um, so, uh, you know, it talks about four generations of men who were actually unable to vote due to prison. So uh, we have a man called Jarvius Cotton. He couldn't vote. And like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather, he was denied the right to participate in our electoral democracy. 
His family tree tells the story of several generations of black men born in the United States, but who were denied the basic freedom that democracy promises, the freedom to vote for those who will make the rules and laws to govern one's life. His great great grandfather couldn't vote because he was a slave. His grandfather was beaten to death by the Ku Klux Klan for attempting. His grandfather was prevented from voting by Klan intimidation. His father was barred by poll taxes and literacy tests. He cannot vote because he, like many men in the United States, has been labeled a felon and is currently on parole. So same system, different name. Mm -hmm. Same system, different name. And she continues throughout the book to make these analogies about um, you know, how we kind of get duped into thinking we have more freedom than we actually have. Um, let's see, the author makes um, very real and disturbing comparison. So basically what we have here is, you know, after slavery, we had reconstruction, and then you had certain laws that were put down because once slavery ended, it was like, all right, well, what are we going to do with all these black people running around um, who we really don't want here, but there's nowhere for them to go. And so they began to make laws to criminalize them. So if you were just standing around, you know, where, which really you might just be standing around because if you just left, left where you were being beaten, and begin to walk and travel, eventually you kind of begin to feel like, well, let me look around and see if someone wants to pay me for work. And by merely just standing around, looking like you had no place to go, you were criminalized. The black codes. Mm -hmm. And so once you were criminalized, um, you kind of got put right back into the same system. Um, you know, so you were kind of placed in a caste system because if you were white and you were wandering around, no one thought anything of it. You were white, you were poor, you know, they might not really want to see them, but they didn't criminalize them because of it. And so begins this caste system of the garment that black people continue to wear, which wasn't the melanin in their skin, but rather the stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think for me, the question after reading this is what actually changed for for America, especially for black Americans, um, specifically even with Obama as president? Like what um, what changed and is it is it taboo for us to ask what changed when Obama was president? Is that taboo? Um, you know, they then began to say, you know, once blacks were free. Um, you know, they couldn't really make them slaves and say slaves, so they had to label it as something else. So then, then they then began to say, oh, these, these people are thugs. And so there was this war on, on thugs, which was really just Jim Crow dressed up as slavery. Super predators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and we went on through that until, you know, the civil rights movements and all of these movements that black people went through until eventually, you know, we've got these ghettos and, but my questions were, um, you know, the author talks about how black people were kind of moving and moving into these slums. They were going further North and even the Northerners didn't really want them, but I guess they felt like it was better than being chased on an open field by the Klan. And so, you know, these ghettos, these inner city ghettos show up and then drugs show up after. But, you know, black people don't know anything, you know, and many of you are probably and probably have been for a long time asking the same question. Where did these drugs show up from? You know, so she's, you know, uh, talking about when crack cocaine began, you know, um, and, and it was sensationalized so much so that, um, you know, you had Reagan, a, 
an old past. He was an actor, you know, and he's like, we're going to get the war on drugs, you know, and the his war on drugs. drugs. Huh? His, his, and his wife, Nancy, he had his wife. Nancy, uh, right. Say no. Right. This is Who drugs. ended up being a klepto? This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Right. Just say no. So, you know, they began with the whole crack thing, but, but crack wasn't an issue in the media yet. It wasn't until they kind of sensationalized it, like 1985. So she points out the dates. Um, and then almost overnight, and, it, and this is like, I can remember, this is kind of strange. Almost overnight, the media was saturated with images of black, quote, crack whores. Yep. Um, you know, or um, another term that she talks about, and this is is welfare queens. Mm -hmm. But really, statistically, black people were not the ones receiving most of the federal aid. A lot of times, black people were denied. Um, so if many of you read The Color of Law, um, you might remember that that was a statistic that was found out. Many of Black people were actually denied. Many Black people living in the projects just needed an affordable place to live. Um, and it became the slums because they were not the owners of it. The owners didn't care about where they had to live. Um, they were denied other places to live. And so many of them kind of piled up and they lived where they could and they managed and they got by. But any place that you let run down is going to look like a quote ghetto. And if I could, if we could right here, just define the term ghetto, um, because a lot of times people mm -hmm. associate the term ghetto that originated with um, the what? Evans family with good times, but it did not. Uh, mm -hmm. Ethnic groups came from other countries. They were the original ghettos. Mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. Some some uh, scholars say it actually goes back to the Jews like thousands yes. of years ago as far as their actual origin. But in contemporary terms, it is uh, being it's, it's used to describe, it was first used to describe so-called immigrants to America who weren't African people. But continue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent points. Um, so the author, you know, she points out a question like, how did how did we get here? Um, because the the thing is, is that poor whites and slaves were really in the same boat. Mm -hmm. And for a while, they kind of started working together. You had Bacon's Rebellion, mm -hmm. um, which actually made the elite white who were the real oppressors. It made them really afraid. And so they had to devise a way to say, well, poor whites and blacks outnumber us. So how can we divide this up? And so what they did was just that. They began to go to these poor white people and say, hey, you're better than this Negro. And if you do this or that, we'll give you a little bit of privilege. Um, you know, uh, and then um, this offered them, the white people, a privilege based on their race. Mm -hmm. But really, they still were poor. But they felt that anything was better than being black. Right. And so, you know, ironically, whites coming to America, uh, they came here for freedom and then turned right around and enslaved someone else. Mm -hmm. Not that they were ever enslaved, but they clearly felt like they were like the poor whites. They ended up doing to the poor whites what they felt the elites had done to them. So they just carried on a tradition of white supremacy. Um, let's see, I am on page 30. Um, so basically what the author is saying that, um, you know, African-Americans, even once they got their freedom, it was really only symbolic. Um, and it's, it's still very symbolic today. We think about, um, you know, the fact that we asked the president in office and have for years for reparations. Mm -hmm. 
and instead what we got was Juneteenth. Right. Um, a holiday which you may or may not get paid for, you may or may not get off, and which many whites do not take serious. Um, so really, it's kind of just a token. Um, most blacks, as the author is saying, were too poor to even enforce their civil rights. Um, and no organization like the NAACP had existed back then to spread the risk and cost. So a lot of times um, people say, well, why didn't they just, you know, vote their way out of that situation? They had rights, but many of them were just, they couldn't read or they were poor or when they went to use those rights, they were kind of rerouted or intimidated and they didn't have money for a lawyer and their lawyer might get lynched alongside them. Hmm. So, um, you know, the, ba the behavior that they had to deter black people from seeking uh, legal equality began way back. You know, as soon as they were freed from slavery, um, there was a system put in place to keep them subordinate. Mm -hmm. um, so you have modern day slavery, which just exists as prison. So if we think about it that way, um, when we talk to young people and someone, can you imagine if, if every time somebody said something about prison or getting locked up, someone simply took prison out and substituted that word for slavery? Wow. And that's something we, we can probably talk about. I hope we get a chance because I was thinking about that today, mm -hmm. how we can change the terms and the terminology. I was reading our Karinga's book mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he talks about changing the terminology but continue right right it's like if you just think about it think about all the things that you lose so a prisoner has as a consequence of his crime not only forfeited his liberty or freedom but all his personal rights except those which the law in its humanity mm. <laughs> accords to him so my question after that was where is the humanity was there ever any humanity shown to anyone that came to the United States and had brown skin or was already here? Was there ever any humanity shown? Um, you know, still today, slavery um, under the Constitution, you know, was punishment for a crime. So when you go to prison, it's punishment for your crime. And it parallels slavery. So anyway, while you're black, right? you know, because in that instance, you kind of lose your humanity under the eyes of the law and people who think themselves to be good law abiding citizens, you lose your humanity. Um, so segregation laws were proposed as a part of a deliberate effort to drive a wedge between poor whites and African Americans. Uh, and, and it worked. Um, main points that the author points out, segregations, uh, the laws were passed as a deliberate wedge. This encouraged even poor whites to feel a sense of superiority even over the richest black and to have authority over them. Um, this distracted poor whites from the fact that they too were victim of class hostility. They were um, directed, they directed their anger towards blacks instead of working together for financial equality. So they got duped, mm -hmm. you know, and, and even to this day, you can meet, you can meet some white people that have been poor for generations. Um, you know, so the by the turn of the 20th century, every state in the South had laws on the books that disenfranchised blacks and discriminated against them in virtually every sphere of life, lending sanction to a racial ostracism that extended to schools, churches, housings, jobs, restrooms, hotels, restaurants, hospitals, orphanage, prisons, funeral homes, morgues, and even cemeteries. So even in death, they preferred to be separate. Even in death, they felt that 
they just didn't want to be around blacks. So poor whites merely uh, received a token and basically up till now, nothing, nothing changed. Um, the death of uh, Jim Crow um, began the second reconstructions. Um, and unfortunately, the blacks that remained in the South, the authors saying, you know, um, it, uh, it kind of backfired on them because when whites kind of riled back up, these poor whites that formed the Klan, well, they just kind of, you know, began diving in on them. And many Southern whites felt that the North had kind of, you know, stepped back on its promise. And they did. And they did. And they did. Read W.B. Du so, Bois's book, Black Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they just removed their protection of Blacks, which ended up, you know, being, it was like abandonment. They because Ruther, Rutherford, not to cut you off, but Rutherford B. Hayes and his famous compromise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think she talks about that too. Yeah, he pulled the troops out of the South. Mm-hmm. Then it, that's why when you know the conservatives always talk about state rights, states' rights, states' rights. That's, where that's why he pulled the troops out of the South and said, "Okay, it's up to the states to govern the way they see fit." But continue, which was really code for "do as you will." Right. Mm -hmm. So you know, I always kind of felt like once blacks, you know, got used in World War II. There was no need for them. <clears throat> so they were just abandoned. Um, you had your homegrown racists right here in North Carolina. Uh, in Congress, North Carolina Senator Sam Irvin drafted a racist uh, manifesto called the Southern Manifesto, which vowed to fight to maintain Jim Crow by all legal means. He succeeded in obtaining the support of 101 out of 128 members of Congress from the 11 original Confederate states. I was like, wow, this is like right here. This was in 1956. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So even though um, all of this happened, you know, um, there was never any killing done by blacks. Um, with extraordinary bravery, civil rights leaders, activists, and progressive clergy launched boycotts, marches, and sit-ins protesting Jim Crow system. They endured fire hoses, police dogs, bombings, and beatings by white mobs, as well as the police. Once again, federal troops were sent to these places in the South to provide protection for Blacks attempting to exercise their civil rights. And the violent reaction of white racists was met with horror from the North. You know, I just always think about um, modern day things when people say, I can't believe that is happening. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they say it in shock when they see a school shooting or a supermarket shooting. And even now, as women's rights have been put on the chopping block and basically sautéed in the frying pan, I can't believe this is happening. But my thing is, you were okay when it was just Black people being demonized. You were okay when they were being lynched. You were okay when Black women's bodies were being used for experiments. You were okay when we were putting, being put in prison. But now that it's all of us, now you can't believe it. But when you can turn and look away from someone who is human being dehumanized, you can turn and look away from anyone so that while it's inching up on your rights, you don't notice it until it's there. So people just keep asking how that's happened. This is how this happens. This whole system, as the author speaks of, was basically founded on keeping slaves. Mm -hmm. it, it was founded on it. Um, Blacks economic needs were aligned with poor whites. Um, I've often wondered, like, was this a mistake 
or was it deliberate that they had poor whites, you know, and blacks? Um, the voice talks about that also in Black Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I suggest everyone reads that book. Um, also, um, Betrayal uh, by, I think, Kenneth Logan. Mm -hmm. um, excellent books that deal with that period. Uh, because, and I'll tell you a good, I'm going to tell you a good document. Well, a movie that's really centered during that period of time, when you're mm -hmm. talking about poor black people and uh, poor white people, uh, that movie is uh, The Great Debaters. I feel like I watched that, but it was so long ago. Denzel, Denzel Washington, The Great Debaters. Yes. Yeah, I need to that's watch that, that again. And yeah. what happened was, it was a guy named, I think his name was Watson. And he started off as being, uh, it was the populist party, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. And he started off being real friendly towards black people, but they flipped him and he became a, 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 a racist. Yeah. Wow. So and that's what the book talks about, the populist movement and how blacks and whites were working together. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like basically, uh, there, it talks about the civil rights movement began to evolve into a poor people's movement. Mm -hmm. It promised to address not only black poverty, but white poverty as well. And y'all all remember what happened shortly after Martin Luther King did that. Mm -hmm. They killed him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Because people don't like to talk about that history of what Martin Luther King was actually going to do in that spring. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had he had planned a massive march on Washington and they were actually going to disrupt some stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was, was like, nope. Yeah. It happened, but it, without Martin, it really didn't have the same power. It didn't have the same magnitude. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Continue. Mm -hmm. Um... So let's see. Conservatives. So um, she goes on to say uh, cities, you know, the rebirth of the caste system. So they claim they did away with it, but really they hadn't. Um, by 1964, um, Barry Goldwater in his presidential campaign, now this is before I was born, aggressively exploited the riots and fears of black crime laying the foundation for the get tough on crime, remember what crime equates to, movement that would emerge years later. In a widely quoted speech, he warned voters, choose the way of the Johnson administration and you have the way of mobs in the street. Civil rights activists who argued that the uprisings were directly related to widespread police harassment and abuse were dismissed by conservatives out of hand. If blacks conduct themselves in an orderly way, they will not have to worry about police brutality, argued West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd. So, who was a member of the Ku Klux Klan at one point? And so, my thing is, um, these so called environments of crime that they talk about, um, or slums or ghettos, how are they created, you know? And so that leads back to color of law, you know? How were they created to begin with? Um, so uh, we began talking about this get tough on crime. Cracking down on crime was the new rhetoric um, that conservative politicians are beginning to say. And um, the author is, you know, asking, at this point in time, you know, who was committing more crimes, poor and working whites or blacks? Yet, who was jailed for more crimes? And so, um, even though, you know, uh, blacks didn't commit as much, they were certainly um, accused and jailed, whether they did it or not. Um, so following the Civil War Party, alignment was mostly entirely regional. The South was sol solidly democratic. Mm -hmm. Embittered by the war, firmly committed to the maintenance of a race racial caste system, and extremely hostile to federal intervention on behalf of African Americans. The North was overwhelmingly Republican. 
And while Republicans were ambivalent ambivalent about equality for African Americans, they were far more inclined to adopt and implement racial justice reforms than their Democratic counterparts below the Mason line. You know, however that began to change, people were like, well, when did the Republicans start getting racist? They did it for votes. They did it for votes. So I always tell people, you know, uh, be careful, you know, about voting for someone because they're Democratic or Republican. Um, Better you make and build your own candidate than to just keep placing hope in a system that is not working. Um, And that's what the author is pointing out. Um, And again, I will refer people to the book. uh, I know the author now. It's Betrayal of the Negro. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rayford Logan, he he goes into that. Um, But one of the things I want to point out is because that's the argument that a lot of people make. Well, you know, the Democrats, well, the Klan was formed under the Democrats. Uh, You know, the Democrats is the Democrats. But here's the thing. You're talking about outside of just the narrow confines of Democrat and Republican. You're talking about a conservative movement. Mm -hmm. See, they they flip it. It's Mm -hmm. not about Democrat and conservative, I mean, it's about a, I mean, Democrat or Republican, it's about the conservative movement. The conservative right. just moved from one party to another. To another. And, and people don't realize whole, that. Flip the whole script. Don't say Republican and Democrat, say conservative. conservative. Ain't no way around that one. Because Thanks. whether you were, you, they were conservative Democrats, I mean, conservative Democrats, then it just came became conservative Republicans. Republicans. Yep. The, yep. the line is conservative, not Democrat or Republic. The consistency is conservative. Yes. Continue. Yes. Yes. All right. So let's see. Um, let's see. Um, so, uh, the author is pointing out uh, the Great De- Depression, mm-hmm. um, whereas there was a sea of change in America with race relations and party alignment with the New Deal, which was spearheaded the Democratic Party of President Franklin. Of course, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was designed to alleviate the suffering of poor people in the midst of the Depression, and Blacks, the poorest of the poor, benefited disproportionately. So I, I highlighted that because, um, you know, the same kind of thing happened uh, again. Uh, poor and working class whites, both in the North and South, no less than African-Americans, responded positively to the New Deal. Um, but um, as a result, the Democratic New Deal coalition evolved into an alliance of urban ethnic groups in the white South that dominated a elo- electoral politics from 1932 to the 1960s. Um, Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the same agenda, um, it's kind of like, and she points this out, that I guess basically whenever there, it came time to vote, what happened was they gave sufficient um, enough tokens to raise black hopes and expectations and after decades of malaligned neglect from washington my question is what exactly have the democrats done what has what has actually really changed for black people um you know we get different people in office and we're happy when they're in office if they look like us if they visually represent us um but we have to ask, you know, what has uh, what has actually really changed for us? Um, so um, thus, in the 1960s, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, two schools of thought were offered to the general public regarding race, poverty and the social order. Conservatives argued that poverty was caused not by structural factors related to class, but rather by culture, particularly black culture. This view support received support from Daniel Patrick, 
Mahoynan's now infamous report on the black family, which attributed black poverty to a black subculture. So there's this, this whole belief that America still has that if you're poor, it's because you just, you're just not working hard enough. Yeah. And that was, and actually that was, um, the Monaghan report was released in 1961 mm -hmm. and it was a secret document and it was never supposed to be released to the general public. Um, you can probably still find it probably online. It's the, uh, Patrick Monaghan report, uh, about the black family. Also, right. um, Samuel Yeti. Samuel Yeti talks about it in his book called The Choice. And he really breaks down the Monaghan Report where they started really blank. And also um, Michelle Wallace, mm -hmm. uh, Black Macho and the Superwoman. She breaks it down as well. They really go into the Monaghan Report and mm. you know how you started. They started blaming the black mother for everything right. that's going on. Now when you hear this, see the Hannity and Sean Hannity's and Tucker the welfare, Coles. the welfare yeah, queens. Yeah, they're still they're still referring to that 1961 mm -hmm. document even today. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yep. So hence, uh, we started to see the war on drugs begin. Um, during this period, Nixon called for a war on drugs, an announcement that proved largely rhetorical, as he declared illegal drugs. Public enemy number one. Mm. Um, but any time that they have a war on something, like I said, you just change in the clothes. So first you had a war on the thugs, you had a war on poverty. Now you got the war on drugs. But really what it is is a war on blacks. Um, and this is still happening today. Um, so, you know... Um, After Nixon, we have Reagan, and once elected, Reagan's promise to enhance the federal government's role in fighting crime was complicated by the fact that fighting street crime has traditionally been the responsibility of state and local government. Mm -hmm. But after a period of time, you know, he brought the FBI in. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, October 1982, he announced officially his administration's war on drugs. Um, but by the time he declared this new war, less than 2% of the American public viewed drugs as the most important issue facing the country. But somehow, practically overnight, the budgets increased for the federal law agencies. Um, between 1980 and 1984, the anti-drug funding increased from 8 million to 95 million. 95 million all is just to keep to to do what but at, at the same time they were the cia was either either allegedly uh -huh. bringing drugs in the south central los angeles uh -huh. read, Los read our dark alliance gary webb we that's or, what we we're talking about yeah. yeah or either they brought it in there allegedly or by their own admission turned a blind eye when it was happening either way it's research it, to a rare contra scandal right so either way whether it was benign neglect or deliberate you know the it, war on it, it, drugs it, it, for blacks you know it destroyed the black community um mm -hmm. unlike the opioid crisis um, the war on drugs for black never had treatment. In fact, this is so bizarre. Just the other day I was talking about um, how I was talking with some doulas and, you know, we were joking because I said, you know, when I was giving birth, they never had uh, nitrous. Like you can get nitrous now. And just jokingly, I said, I wonder if people even take like mushrooms or smoke pot. And she said, oh, no, like if they if they find any of that in your system or in, I guess, in the baby or the the uh, placenta, they come and they take the baby. Mm. Mm. And uh, she said, if you have Medicaid, and I said, wow, so what if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna, or what if you're just paying out of pocket? Do they turn a blind eye to that mother or do they offer her treatment? So when does it go from perhaps this woman who 
if she kept this baby, deliberately wants this baby, cares for this baby, perhaps she just has a drug problem. So you would rather take this baby from the mother, jail the mother, separate the baby because she's poor and likely black or Hispanic and on Medicaid than to say, what treatment can I give you? What treatment can I give you to help you through this? Mm -hmm. So again, being black and poor, you're criminalized. But here we have it. You're going to have the baby regardless now, even if you are a, quote, crack whore. You're just going to bring another baby in the world, your choice or not. Do you remember the myth of the crack babies back in the 80s era predicting that uh, eventually the children of the people are addic addicted to crack were going to turn to these monsters? And yeah, and I've never seen never that. never really happened? I've never seen that. Um, yeah. It was called... Yeah, we lived, we lived across the hall from a woman that she initially had this baby in foster care and, you know, he was born with it in his system and he basically just had to stop cold turkey as a baby. Um, and he would really cry and it was just sad. There was, I never saw like any type of, and this is the foster mother, but I never saw them like come out and help her or show her what to do or so even if they felt like that was a thing, what intervention did they ever offer? They're just watching it unfold. But it never happened. I think Davey it never D, happened anyway. I think Davy D exposed that years ago. I think it was Davy D or one of those hip hop scholars. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the crack baby thing was a myth. Yeah. You know, they said these babies they, are going to be addicted to crack and they're going to grow up to be crackheads and yeah. they're not going to society. So yeah. Yeah. I mean. They definitely are born with it in their system, but unless someone's cooking it up for them, letting them inhale through the bottle, they're not an addict. You know, they just were born with it in their system. And they, you know, unfortunately, they go through withdrawal. Um, it's just, it's, it was very disturbing to see. It was very sad. Um, so, uh, you know, let's see. Um, let me make some other points before we run out. <laughs> oh, this, 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 this. And while we're on the subject of, um, while we're on the subject of the war on drugs, which began, um, you know, I can't talk about this book without talking about this. Um, you know, these tough, uh, get tough movements. Um, uh, in 1991, the sentencing project reported that um, the number of people behind bars in the United States was unprecedented in world history. Um, despite law dropping impact on the get tough movement, um, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans revealed any inclination to slow down the pace of incarceration. So they knew it was like, oh my God, this is, this is like outstanding. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have Bill Clinton coming up for president in 92, right? And his main goal was like, you know, that he was going to be tougher on crime than any president. And true to his word, he was. And guess who uh, helped him do that? Good old Sleepy Joe. And mm. ironically, his son Hunter was addicted to crack cocaine. He was able to receive rehab again and again. And he was never forced into homelessness, nor was he ever criminalized. He received much needed help as an addict. So why doesn't that happen for black people? So what the author um, points out is that being an addict while black meant that you were probably going to lose your, your place to live. You were going to be criminalized. And if you had a certain amount of it, over a certain amount, you could even get the death penalty. Crazy. For being an addict. Hmm. She talks about... Um, 
you know, this war on drugs and how it affected the Fourth Amendment, um, you know, such as like, uh, you think about the four, Fourth Amendment and you think about these no-knock warrants, but because of their aggression with the war on drugs and realizing that it was with black and Latino people, they felt it was okay to violate this. And so they did. And so they did um, right up under the guise of unreasonable suspicion, which really equals fear of black skin. So you could get somebody, you know, pulling a Breonna Taylor on your house in the middle of the night under what they felt was reasonable suspicion. Um, same thing, stop and frisk laws, you know. I can remember my cousin got stopped and frisked in the Bronx for cuffing his pants. For cuffing his pants? Yep, rolling his pants up because he didn't want them, he didn't want to step on the back of them. He was I mean, but what was the charge for cuffing his pants? Exactly. Like, why are you frisking him? Because he's cuffing his pants. I guess maybe they thought he was hiding something in the cuff, maybe. I not even. Oh, they no. thought he was young and he was black. You know, cleanest kid I knew. So, um, you know, uh, these court cases, once you were arrested, um, a lot of people um, might have been guilty. But police usually release the innocent on the street, often without a ticket, citation, or even an apology. So their stories were rarely heard in court. Uh, the author points out most people after they had been arrested, they were brutalized. Um, and if they were in a poor black neighborhood, then they really didn't have money and access to a lawyer to go back and, you know, file a claim against someone anyway. Um, you know, so they, they just weren't. So the number is astounding. And I would gather that if they had free quality legal representation for people that they would see even more of these cases. Um, 1.6 million dollars, uh, or rather, hang on a second. 1.6 million arrested for sale, manufacture, or possession by 2020. This is the number of people. Uh, the author also talks about uh, this waging the war. And she begins to talk about um, what I like to call follow the money. Mm -hmm. um, we often ask, like, when, what, what was the incentive for them to do this? Like, you know, you had child molesters, you had murderers, you had rapists, you had thieves, you had so many other um, different types of criminals, you know, white collar too, but they weren't really, you know going after them that way. So, you know, they got this funding and one must ask, where did the funding uh, come from? Because you had the, the SWAT, which then began to be a big thing. The rate increase of the use of SWAT teams has been astonishing. In 1972, there were just a few hundred paramilitary drug raids per year in the United States. By the early 1980s, there were 3,000. By 1996, 30,000. And the list goes up. And the list goes up. And like you were saying, Spitfire, um, off camera, this is a deep conversation. Mm -hmm. And so keep rolling. Mm -hmm. words, keep rolling. We're, All we're, right. We're on your time. Keep rolling. All because, right. All right. Yeah. This, this is. Um, we're just not going to be able to put on Instagram, but keep keep going because yeah. oh, you know yeah. Instagram, yeah, Instagram it's, has that limit. So we're just going to have to do YouTube and Facebook. But keep going, keep going. Yeah. So I told you, it like the the more you dig, the deeper it gets. Yeah, keep so, going. So, um, you know, in 1981, President Reagan persuaded Congress to pass the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act, which encouraged the military to give the local and state, uh, basically access. And this is um, this was pushed and embraced by both George Bush and good old Bill, Bill Clinton. Mm 
they then got incentives. Okay. So when they got the incentives, then they saw the arrest records soar. So, um, the paramilitary units were often justified to city councils and skepticalized citizens as an essential to fight terrorism or deal with hostage situations. Um, but now they were going to be, you know, deployed for drug enforcement. The extra, the extra funding for the local police departments received was tied to anti-drug policing. So basically the arrest in order to receive the cash incentive, it had to be for a drug arrest. What a hell of an incentive, huh? Mm -hmm. um, and back then it was $153 in state and federal funding. Yep. So as if the free military equipment, training and cash grants were not enough, the Reagan administration provided law enforcement with yet another financial incentive to devote extraordinary resources to drug law enforcement. State and local enforcement agencies were granted the authority, this was the big one, to keep for their own use the vast majority of cash and assets they seize when waging the drug law. So basically, <laughs> When a drug dealer is sent to jail, I'm quoting her, there are many others ready and willing to take his place, but seizing that means of production, some legislators reasoned, may shut down the trafficking business for good. So in other words, they pulled a 50 cent on him, the original 50 cent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often wonder, they stole those drugs, but did they really destroy all of them or did they just get redistributed? And I'm sure I'm not the only one you know um well i mean the, that it, i don't know if you saw that uh special uh that hbo uh not special that hbo series we run the city about baltimore mm -mm. it went into that how corrupt the baltimore police were and how they allegedly stood were well, not allegedly some of them stuck i guess you call them the jump out boys stole the drugs and resold them Wow, I no, HBO's call. We 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 run the city. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. So local police agencies were able to retain up to eighty percent of the assets value that um, these arrests produced. So, uh, my question is, how much of that money went to the victims? If they claim that this war on drugs is so violent. Um, how much of that money went back into the, the communities that they they are saying that this destroyed? None. Um, not surprisingly, this drug forfeiture regime proved highly lucrative for law enforcement, offering more than enough incentive to wage the war on drugs, according to the report commissioned by the Department of Justice between 1988 and 1992 alone. I think it's Burn. There's a company called Burn funded a drug task force seized over one billion in assets. So this company in 19, just, just between those years. Now they talk about how violent it is, but the three movies that I posted, mm -hmm. you saw the years. So you had New Jack City, 1991. You had, uh, what was the other one? Sugar Hill. Mm -hmm. 1993 and fresh 1994 and, all, and don't forget and, minister society south central boys in the hood mm -hmm. all at the peak all at the peak um you know <laughs> and ironically we we knew who signed that you know that bill for the drug thing but uh then they had the reform act which was supposed to protect citizens but failed um so this was supposed to represent, help people that were arrested, you know, to be able to afford a lawyer. But of course it didn't work. Ironically, um, someone who was actually charged with um, a crime could get free counsel. So if you were poor, 
um, in certain places, it, like if the police seized your car and it was worth $500 or took $500 from your home, you had to kind of pay to represent yourself to get that back. But if you were poor, you didn't have the money anyway, so you, you, were, just, you were just out of luck. Either way, they kept the assets. Um, so poor people accused um, more than 40 years ago in Gideon versus Wainwright, the Supreme Court ruled that poor people accused of a serious crime were entitled to counsel. I note that because it says a serious crime. So what if you were just charged with something minor, but you lost some work from it? Were you not entitled to counsel? Hmm. Arthur shows that harsh sentencing often minor for often minor offenses resulted in plea bargains. Often drug users or poor young black and Latino young men, often they would get two strikes. So you might get a strike, one for having it in your possession. And if you were in a car, you were transporting it. So that was two strikes right there. And then they basically were like, well, you already got two strikes. You, you know, this is going to happen if you don't take this plea bid. So they, they pleaded guilty. And then due to a lack of real true rehabilitation in the system, um, because they, it was blocked, they often had some sort of relapse. It might be something small and gone, mm -hmm. gone. Many judges uh, and appointing, uh, appointing, appointees during the Reagan era disagreed with it and felt guilt and even depression. Even ones who were notorious harsh sentencers um, felt bad about sending someone uh, away for life. So why then do these laws continue to flourish? Follow the money. Mm -hmm. So now we're getting into the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once a person is labeled a felon, he or she is ushered into a parallel universe. Like I said, paralleling what? Slavery. You lose your privileges. Um, there's a stigma and they're all perfectly legal. It's perfectly legal to tell someone, sorry, I can't give you a job because you used to be a felon, even though you served your time, mm -hmm. even though you were a model citizen. Sorry, I can't help you. Sorry, you can't apply for Section 8. Sorry, you can't apply for food stamps. Sorry, I know you're pregnant, but you can't get WIC. So basically, go die. The question then is how exactly does a formerly colorblind criminal justice system achieve such racially discriminatory results? Rather easily, it turns out, the process occurs in two stages. The first is to grant law enforcement officials extraordinary discretion regarding whom to stop, search, arrest, and charge for drug offenses, thus ensuring that conscious and unconscious racial beliefs and stereotypes will be freely given. Um, then they close the courthouse doors um, to all claims that they may say, hey, this is racially done and demand that anyone who wants to challenge racial bias in the system offer in advance clear proof. So they just were like, prove it, prove it. I stopped you because you were speeding. Well, I wasn't, prove it. Mm -hmm. This evidence will almost never be available in the era of colorblindness because everyone knows but does not say that the enemy in the war on drugs can be identified by race. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, it's just a lot. Uh, I'll point out a few more things in the book. Um... But basically people, like I said, they want to know why all these things have happened. Um, America kind of has basically had this not in my backyard, not my problem issue. Um, you know, the author is talking about how two students, um, you know, one in college, white, and maybe one not in college, black, uh, may have drugs 
you know, whereas the student, the white student in college may have drugs and no one's really looking for him. And they may feel like, you know, um, well, he's in school, let him go. And if it's a black kid, you know, it's a lot easier to go out into the hood, so to speak, and round someone up. You're bound to get one. If you go in a bag of M&Ms, you're bound to get a red one. Right. So what if you got a yellow one? Throw him in there too. But no one's really concerned about it um, because it's not in their backyard. It's not their children. So what does an ex-felon face when being released? Housing challenges. Um, and these were the same things that were under Jim Crow. It's legal to deny housing to felons, so no federal housing project, no Section 8. Even a current tenant, as I might um, add, can't um, offer someone who's a felon a place to stay uh, because they could lose their um, they could lose their place to stay. And also, I don't know if any of you knew this, but they also charge them fees during lockup. So a lot of times people are like, well, you guys work when you're in prison. Don't you have money saved up? They charge them fees. So <laughs> this might make you laugh. Mm. You know, you had the welfare reform legislation signed by a blowjob bill um, where, you know, some black people... <laughs> Some black people really called him the first black president. Um, in 1996, TANF, uh, I think it's Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, um, puts a five-year limit on lifetime benefits. Like, basically, if you have, you know, welfare or whatever, it's like, not nah, after five years, sorry. Um, and it also bars individuals with drug-related felony convictions. So they don't care if you're pregnant. They don't care if you have AIDS. They don't care if you have cancer. They don't care if the reason you got locked up was because you were mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And the gold star, the gold star was voting. Cherry on the cake. So really, after they did all that, they basically kind of castrate you politically. Like, sorry, you won't be reproducing your thoughts and feelings in this society. Ironically, you know, uh, he ended up being on the chopping block for his behavior. And look how he was. He was never seen as a criminal, even though he lied to billions of American people. So some people say, well, what is the, what about gangster rap and the culture of violence embraced by so many black youth? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the author is saying, yeah, the easy answer is to say yes and wag a finger at those that are behaving badly. That is the road most traveled, and it has not made a bit of difference. The media fawned over Bill Cosby, who was publicly lynched years later, and other figures when they give stern lectures to black audiences about black men failing to be good black fathers and failing to lead respectable lives. Respectability and politics. Right. And and the crazy thing is, I remember Obama and she talks about this, too. Obama gave a speech, too. It was on Father's Day about the absent black man in the community. Like, dude. Why don't you why can't you say it? And so, you know, she talks about that. Like, why can't why can't a lot of these civil rights activists just come out and say it? Yeah. Remember, Obama went after the rabbits. He went after uh Mm -hmm. Conway, he went after Little Wayne, but mm -hmm. when it came to going after the people who were actually attacking him, the Tea Party. Yeah, so, I no yeah. Um, The author points out that Black images are controlled mostly by whites and are nothing more than a modern day minstrel show put on for the purpose of white entertainment with movies like, what I said, New Jack City, Fresh, Sugar Hell, um, Did She Lie? She didn't and lie. Everyone reads the American Directory of Certified Uncle Toms, and that really mm. broke down. Mm, 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 mm. There's a book that she talks about here called um, "States of Denial" by Stanley Cohen. Did you read this? Mm. I haven't read that. One. 
She said the book examines how individuals and institutions, uh, victims, perpetrators, and bystanders know but yet deny the occurrence of oppressive acts. And and this is kind of what we're going through today, you know, and it's kind of like being unveiled and people are like, oh my God, I'm shocked. But all the years preceding, they didn't see all that. It's like something happens and it's more sensationalized each time. And each time they seem so surprised, but it's it's been happening. It's been happening. Um, you know, so she talks about, uh, I guess, the steps. Uh, so she says, first it begins, the police caught with the roundup. Police arrest multiple people, usually through drug stings operations in poor communities of color. Then they get the cash reward through the federal grant programs and drug forfeiture laws. Then the criminal is denied legal and good representation. They get a conviction. Then they're placed on parole or probation. They get a lifetime of monitoring and possible re-imprisonment due to small infractions. All place them right back under the caste system for life. And then they're also dehumanized. So in this way, they're kept. They're kept as a slave. So once you get in that system, you don't get out. And these are just parallels, like I said, of slavery. Mm -hmm. It's a good book. Okay. Can you touch on uh, Gangnet? Um, she talked about, and this is something that's really has been popularized in Durham. Oh. Um, I forgot what she called in her book, but there was a process mm -hmm. or operation she talked about in her book. It's called GangNet in North Carolina. It's called something else in her book, where they would have a database of alleged gang members. And they would store these names of mostly young black men in this database. And I know in Durham and other places in North Carolina, it's called, again, it's called GangNet. And People are saying, well, how can you decide who's in a gang and who's not a gang? But just mm -hmm. on the way they dress or whatever, you're throwing our children in this massive database. So anytime you pull the name of, oh, suspected gang member. You remember that part in the book? I vaguely remember it. Um, I don't think I highlighted it only because uh, there's a part where she's talking about how um, the police basically... Um, like like she said, they can use their discretion, which yes. is not illegal. And right. so what they may do is drive into certain neighborhoods under the guise that, hey, we know suspected crimes occur here. And they may drive past a black school and they may see a young black male with baggy pants and a long T-shirt standing outside surrounded by his friends and deem that as he looks suspicious and round mm -hmm. them up. Mm -hmm. But those same police, if they drive through and see a white child doing the same exact thing in a schoolyard, talking to his, surrounded by his friends, they won't do the same thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, she, she did, I think I did highlight that, but I don't think I highlighted the gang net. I do remember it being a thing that they were talking about, um, here in Durham, like how they were thinking of putting kids that they felt were more susceptible to being a gang in a database, as if they can somehow predict who is going to be in a gang and who isn't. And I feel like, well, if you're that damn intelligent, can you predict who the next school shooter is? Yeah, I mean, that program was called Factor of Three. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was by the Durham Justice Department, Factor Three, and what they were doing was, and actually I think they still are doing, if I'm not mistaken, I think they kind of slipped that one in. Uh, they <laughs> were saying that they could, I think that by the third grade they could they really predict. predict whether a child was going to be in a gang or not. They want to track them. And you, you know, know how they were tracking them? Great. Um, I think they were tracking them. One, based on race. Mm. Two, based on their economic background. So if you're black and you're poor, 
and then if you had any type of suspension. Hmm. That's how many black kids? You get what I'm saying? And where our black children are suspended at a higher rate for less offended offenses in school. So you're basically saying any given black child can be a gang member, but you somehow don't have a program to decide which one of these white children is carrying a gun to school or the components to make a bomb. You don't know that. Again, all under the guise of the war on drugs. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't think I put a sticky on that section. I probably should have. Um, she talks about African um Americans living in poor communities face dual frustrations. This is really what I wanted to talk about. Uh meaning they want to live in a safe place but they don't want law enforcement to um, exist in a harsh manner. Um, African-American women in poor neighborhoods are torn. They worry about their young sons getting involved in gang activity. They worry about their sons possibly selling or using drugs. They worry about their children getting caught in crossfire of warring uh, gangs. The mothers want better crime and law enforcement, yet, they understand that increased levels of law enforcement potentially saddle their children with a felony conviction. And nowadays, uh, it could be a death, you know, um, a mark that can ensure, ensure economic and social marginalization. Um, you know, I thought about that because, like, just yesterday, having choppers over my head in the middle of the night, and there was no police transparency, even after calling. Um, so let's talk about some solutions. Um, let's talk about some solutions. Um, you know, she had some, I had some. Um, one of the things was she noted that um, a lot of the, the civil rights groups have kind of like fallen back. And many of us are like, why aren't they saying anything? Why aren't they coming out the woodworks? Um, why aren't they doing more to speak out about what's happening? Um, and many times I think what she was feeling was, and even wrote that some of them are so um, worried about joining in this task force of this war on drugs that they haven't made the connection that it's a war on us. Um, so they're trying to get funding for the war on drugs. Mm -hmm because they feel like, well, we got to get ahead of this war on drugs instead of saying we need to get people to see that black people are humans, you know? Um, so some of the things is uh, start a civil rights group on your in your own community. So she felt like, you know, just local things, like just keep it localized. Um, for me, I feel like record and speak out when you witness something illegal and racist. Um, you know, don't let the media carjack your image. Because mm -hmm. many times, like just like last night, uh, they claimed it was a carjacking. 20 cops for a carjacking and a helicopter? Come on now. Something was occurring. But like I said, there was no transparency and they likely won't bring it up because as I heard, they didn't even catch whoever it was. So um, she said, we can vote for a push for change within culture of law enforcement. Uh, as she says on page 233, um, you know, policing, uh, it, it really it really needs to be revamped. Um, I'm not personally saying that policing should be just completely done away with. But what I do think is it needs to be um, a give and take of trust. You know, between the police and the community, there needs to be transparency because there's almost none. There needs to be commitment. You know, it can't just be this thing like, well, I had a bad experience in that neighborhood. I'm out of here. Make it better. Commit to making it better as an officer who is serving and protecting that community. Um, they need resources. So we can't expect them to do their job if, you know, they're all running to one place to do a small task when 
they could just have cameras. They could have cameras on the street lights, just like they do in Morrisville. So they're not chasing citizens for tickets. They just have the speeding light. They, they just have the camera. Like, I don't have to chase you anywhere. You're right there on the camera. And right. that would allow them to be in other areas. They need a mental, you know, task force for people that are having issues. They like they don't even come out to get a dog that's loose. Did you know that? Until the dog bites someone. Backwards. And it's just because they're, there's not enough of them. The pay is not great. The incentives, you know. Well, um, and Durham, I think last week, late last week, they started their mental health patrols where they're going to send mental health workers instead of armed police. So, yeah. We'll see how that goes. I hope it goes well. Um, but I think they're going to see that they are outnumbered because you have homelessness. And if you've never been homeless, you don't know what it's like. And there's a very fine line between sanity and insanity. You're homeless. You're not sleeping at night. You're not eating right. You haven't bathed. You feel degraded. You're going to have something going on. You're going to have something going on. And now with the uptake in homelessness, you're going to have more people that are having a mental crisis breakdown. So they're going to find that they're short staff. You know, they just need to head on, make it, make it equal for everyone. You know, if people have equal access to work and opportunity. They can feed their family. They can get a place to live that's affordable. They can hold on to what is theirs. And they're not out here sleeping on the streets, uh, stealing and going to jail for a minor crime, like stealing bread when they're hungry. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so she feels like, you know, uh, black activists and leaders, um, she's questioned, should they revisit the affirmative action issue? Was it helpful? I think she was saying that because she felt like, um, you know, there was a national, I'm reading a little bit, movement to save affirmative action, but so much so that they kind of weren't really paying attention to the actual issues that black people were having, which, you know, couldn't be solved with affirmative action. It wasn't really about that because black people showed that they could have their own community. And that still you know, was to their demise. Um, I'll read you what she said. Affirmative action may be counterproductive in yet another sense. It lends credence to a trickle-down theory of racial justice. So basically this notion that giving a relatively small number of people of color access to key positions or institutions will inevitably redound to the benefit of the larger group. That that can't happen. Uh, Brother Minister Paul, I recall both of us mentioning this gang data bank at one Durham City Council meeting. Brother Zadiki just mentioned. So yeah. So um. we can have those types of solution. Um, one of the big steps that a lot of black people felt was made like just with affirmative action and equality was having a black president. However, um, like she says before, we kick back, relax and wait for racial justice to trickle down. Let us not forget and consider this. Obama chose Joe Biden, good old sleepy Joe, one of the Senate's most strident drug warriors as his vice president, the man he picked to serve as his chief of staff in the White House, um, was a major proponent of the expansion of the drug war. So um, he even felt like he could be part of this war on drugs. So it doesn't really matter for us as black people who's in office. Um, I think what matters is, you know, it's going to be a local fight for us. You know, we'll have to start there. Solutions also include whites. Stop being silent. Your silence is consent and acceptance. 
and she feels like uh, we as black people should ask for more than ending mass incarceration. We should end the racial caste in America. I'm in agreement with that. Um, so I'll wrap this up um, with a James Baldwin quote that she has. And I love James Baldwin. It's, in, it's from his book published in 1962 called The Fire Next Time. Mm -hmm. This is the crime of which I accuse my country and countrymen and for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. It is their innocence which constitutes the crime. This innocent country set you down in a ghetto in which, in fact, it intended that you should perish. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. You have, and many of us have, defeated this intention and by a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents who believe that your imprisonment made them safe are losing their grasp on reality. But these men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers. And if the word integration means anything, this is what it means. That we with love shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. Great men have done great things here and will again. And we can make America what it must become. It will be hard, but you will come from sturdy peasant stock men who picked cotton and dammed rivers and built railroads and in the teeth of the most terrifying odds achieved an unassailable and monumental dignity. You come from a long line of great poets since Homer. One of them said, the very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. We cannot be free until they are free. God bless you and Godspeed. James Baldwin. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Powerful, power. powerful yeah. presentation as usual, sister. Full of information. Um, if people missed the live chat, uh, live Facebook, of course, it will be on YouTube and on Twitter and on Facebook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But excellent book review. I, I really enjoyed it. So you have any closing comments? Um, No, uh, I did see Sharon's comment. She said no political um no political group is going to do everything for you. And I, I do agree with that. No politician that is in office is going to um, be able to solve this. Um, you have one coin and it has two sides. And so you have to think about the fact that that coin is still worth the same value, no matter which side it's on. And so at the end of the day, I think um, Black people in America need to know their own value, not the value of whether someone's a Democrat or a Republican or um, whether they're conservative. Um, they need to know what they stand for and begin to find a sound footing in that and begin to build with people that will do the same and begin to make communities for themselves where they feel safe. And until they do that, they won't have anything for their children to mimic. You know, the problem is, we don't have an image that is ours, that is sound for our children to mimic. So they're just doing what they see on TV and what was before them. And they're just doing it in a more grand way. And now with social media, we're seeing it more, but there's nothing new under the sun. Um, you know, black people have shown in the past that we can have our own communities and we don't need a politician to raise those communities or build it for us. We just need each other. Excellent point, excellent discussion. So uh, looking forward to the next book review. Uh, we'll discuss what it's gonna be, maybe 1619. Hmm. 
maybe we, sh we shall discuss we shall discuss we shall discuss so as always we leave with the black messiah motto stop waiting for a savior and be one shalom shalom <laughs>